couple things we tried that didn't work. Um, I first got back to the farm in 78 with my wife and three kids and um, a farm of 2,400 acres. It was a great size for one family, wheat and cattle ranch, all dry land, north central Montana, but not really big enough for two families. So the immediate um, question was, well, what could we do to um, bring another enterprise onto the farm? Or uh, my dad was still a few years from retirement, and we weren't, um, we hadn't really joined the modern club of, of just buying out your neighbors if you're coming back to the farm. That's kind of what they do nowadays. So I tried um, to set up a soil testing laboratory. Um, I, I, my, my background was, was the plant biochemistry. I love um, science. Uh, I soon discovered that the really busy time for soil testing laboratories is the same time that we're really busy getting ready to see. So that didn't work. That, that lasted about um, one half season. Um, the next idea I had was selling prairie dog puppies. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm really big on turning liabilities into assets, and uh, prairie dogs is kind of one of our liabilities, and um, the Japanese were going to pay a $100 a puppy, and they were getting from Texas, sucking them out of the ground. They were all coming up, all damaged and bleeding, and they put them in a box, and by the time they got to Japan, over half of them were dead or dying from infection. I told them, well, I will... Um, flood them out of the ground and net them with a fishnet as they come <laughs> swimming up and uh, there'll be no um, damage, they won't be, uh, just, um, uh, they won't get sick, they won't get infected and we should net a hundred bucks. I thought this would be great. And then I started into the red tape with export of live animals um, out of the country and that's as far as I got. Um, I also tried to sell directly to, our, our grain directly to uh, customers in California, uh, just all by myself. And that worked really well for one or two years, and then they didn't buy any more from me, and I didn't know why. <laughs> I found out later that what they were looking for was a higher protein a week than I had uh, that particular year. And so um, after that happened, uh, I met a cousin of mine from California, and we joined up together to form... Um, Two wheat companies. One, one was Montana Flour and Grain in Fort Benton, uh, because that's as close as the trucker would come to haul our grain away to California. And he was a Montana Wheat Company in California. He was my customer's relations contact. I was quality control. And we found the kind of grain that our customers wanted. So we started um, selling wheat, not by the truckload, but by the sack. This is really a big advantage. And uh, that went really well. Then they wanted, from that point, they wanted stone ground whole wheat flour. And I said, well, how about we put the stone mill, because I see what Great Harvest does. They have the stone mill right in their um, bakery. I said, put the stone mill in your bakery. Oh, we can't do that in California. We got to worry about dust control. We got all this stuff. So we got in the stone milling business, and we were offering certified. But the other thing they wanted was organic. And I said, well, I hardly know how to spell organic. But um, I'll go see what I can find. And this is in about 80 and I found somebody in northeast corner of Montana that said they were organic and I got a certificate from them they signed saying they were organic and that was good enough for me and it was good enough for them and it was good enough for the customers and so we got started organic and um, we did our first organic experiment on our farm in 86 I was an instant convert and I've been preaching ever since as anybody who knows me knows and uh, so we were in the stone milling business well, I didn't know anything about stone milling my I found, had a good friend in Great Falls who was um, selling insurance. He hated his job. I said, well, why don't you come work for me and you can be my stone miller? And he said, oh, that sounds great. And he went home and told his wife, and she cried. And um, <laughs> they moved to Fort Benton anyway. And uh, we found somebody to help us on the East Coast learn how to be a stone miller. So that's how we got started in that. And then a couple years later in 86, we went to a food show in California for the first time. And my dad took a handful of ancient giant wheat. And uh, that led us to really the biggest project of our, um, of our last 30 years, and that's our Kamu project. And that turned out to be the biggest success. Um, I started out with the idea, well, this is a novelty. And then we started researching. People said to us, you know, we can't eat normal wheat, but we can eat this stuff. Now, what is this stuff? And I said, wow, well, we'll give you some more. Uh, and, and we started doing research on it. And now we've published 23 
peer-reviewed journal articles from our research in Italy comparing modern wheat to ancient wheat. And we found an astounding amount of information now that we understand how we have changed modern wheat and how and why so many people can't eat it. This has opened up an amazing amount of doors. So that has been really our biggest success and led to all kinds of other spin-offs. Uh, the latest one is selling now. We start so we went from selling wheat from the truckload to the the bushel, then the, the flour to the pound. Guess what? If you sell it by the ounce? <laughs> this really helps the bottom line on the farm. So now we're selling by the ounce. Crackling Kahoot is a great snack. I've we've given some out here. There's still some around. There's some in the silent oxen. And uh, we're manufacturing this right in Big Sandy. We've increased the population of Big Sandy now with the oil barn I told you about earlier. Um, there's an oil barn story. Right here is a bottle of oil uh, by 5.3%. We're really excited about this. Yeah. Yes. And now with the oil, we can make soap. Uh, we're actually not making this in Big Sandy. We're having we send our oil to Missoula, and they make soap. But soap comes back, and we sell that. My my daughter, I have an orchard. I didn't tell you too much about that. And one of the across my orchard um, is um, Concord grapes. And um, my daughter is making. How are we doing? Are we out? You're done. I'm done. <laughs> this will be one sentence. My daughter sure. is making red wine vinegar, and it is to die for. And imagine this now, folks, <coughs> vinegar and oil combination selling at the parks in Yellowstone and Glacier. That's what's next. So Woo! thank you very much. Wow. All right, so I saw the title, how to, how to Make More Profit from What You're Already Doing, but I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> um, I moved back to farm in 1976, wheat and barley farm uh, up north of Great Falls, Conrad. And um, kind of a small farm. My dad was, you know, kind of a typical uh, conventional farmer. And there were just a lot of pieces that didn't make sense to me. So I, on principle, said I'm not going to grow wheat. Okay, so I've been on the farm since 1976. Um, once I took over the farm, basically, in the, about a decade later, uh, have not grown an acre of wheat. So I know nothing about making more profit from what you're already doing. Um, but uh, in the mid-80s, uh, three other friends and I got together. Uh, Jim Barngrover, who's here somewhere, Bud Bardo over here, Tom Hastings, uh, deceased last year. Three kids moving back to the family farms, basically, and said, uh, we want to convert these farms to certified organic. That was easy enough to do, in a sense. Uh, we kind of figured that out over time. The problem was, there was no place to sell what we were growing. You know, uh, 30 years ago, there really was no organic market in Montana. Uh, existed on the coast and so forth. Plus, um, we knew we needed uh, to replace synthetic nitrogen with biological nitrogen. Basically, we needed legumes. We needed to grow a crop that would actually replenish the soil and not extract nutrients out of the soil like, you know, uh, like wheat and barley does. So we focused on legumes to do that. Um, there's also no way to process that. You know, you harvest it, you put it in a truck, then what? How do you get it to market? How do you get that food quality? Uh, so we started this business called Timeless Seeds, uh, really with, with the purpose of channeling that, that kind of raw uh, farm production into a food grade product and getting it into the marketplace. So uh, this year's our 30 year anniversary. And um, we really, you know, we decided not to do what everybody else was doing. Um, our, our marketing mantra is, um, um, unique varieties, premium quality, nutrient density. That's really that's really what Timeless Seeds is all about. Um, started with the production off off our existing four farms, and uh, now we contract with about thirty farmers across the country. But you know, within those within that mantra, um, unique varieties. What that means is don't do what everybody else is doing. Okay, so. We heard somewhere this guy over in Big Sandy, you know, was thinking about doing organic wheat. He said, okay, so we're not gonna do organic wheat. MMI was doing a little organic wheat. General Mills, I think was maybe about that time or a little later, they need organic wheat. Somebody else already doing that, we're not gonna do that. Um, the second piece of that was um, um, uh, premium quality. And that's really been our calling card from the beginning, you know, and I guess that's the advice I'd give to anybody that, um, you know, trying to you know increase value to their products is um, 
be the best in the market. That's all. You know, um, if you're if you're growing a commodity, you're growing, um, you're you're basically in the game of, of a race to the bottom. Whatever's the cheapest, um, you know, that's 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 where the buyers go. And we look at it totally different. If our product is not the most expensive on the shelf, I want to know about it because that means that that means that we are not good enough. That somebody else is better than we are. So uh, basically, from the beginning, our business model has kind of been the opposite of what you hear in you know an economics class. Is uh, you keep you beat on price, we can beat on quality. That's all. Uh, the third piece is uh, is um, nutrient density, uh, and I think Gabe talked about that a little bit this morning. Uh, but kind of the takeaway message for for that, you know, for me is uh, sell a product, develop a product that, where the market does not yet exist. Okay, again, not very good advice uh, from an economist point of view, but over time. Over time, you know, for us it was 30 years, but now nutrient density is huge, right? It's all about it's all about the connection between nutrition in the soil, nutrition in the food, and human health. And um, so, in a sense, you know, I guess you know, kind of the market has caught up to us. And what we found by doing that, uh, you know, those three things is that uh, there is a place, you know, for a relatively small business um, in the uh, in the food system that can not only um, uh, you know, support not just the four of us and, and not just, you know, 30 farmers that we currently um, contract with, but can support the local community. Our plant, we started producing in, in, in uh, outbuildings in my farm in 1987. Eventually moved into Vita Pole Elevator in Conrad about 15 years ago. Moved to um, a more appropriate facility down out of Great Falls in Ohm. A small community. We now employ uh, 20 people under that roof. So Bob is doing it with his family in Big Sandy. Um, you know, Timeless Seeds is now the largest employer in all Montana. Uh, we sell our products uh, all over the world. Uh, sell some in, in retail packs that are in hundreds of, of stores around the uh, around the U.S. High margin works great. Relatively low volume for us. So we also sell into the, into the food service market, uh, the natural food distribution market, 25 pound bags, 50 pound bags. We still sell them in, in 2,000 pound totes. Um, and as important as it is to diversify you know, your production, for us it's also important to diversify the markets. So uh, we sell some consumer direct on, on a website, a very small slice of the pie for us, some in retail bags, some to food distributors, uh, we also sell to um, uh, food service and, you know, and campuses around the country, Berkeley, Missoula, Stanford University, and so forth, um, and also sell to food manufacturers, Eden Foods, uh, Blue Apron, Patagonia Provisions, and a certain percent goes to, uh, goes to export markets, too. So for us, it's just, you know, premium quality, do what nobody else does, diversify the markets, and uh, it's worked out. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Joe Willauer. I'm the executive director at the View Local Development Corporation as Headwaters RCMD, which is the second and fifth floor of this building. So first off, I want to say thank you for coming to Butte. I, we appreciate it a lot. Um, we know it's a great place to have these events, starting with the fact that there's a brewery walking distance every which way you go from right here. <laughs> um, with that being said, one of the programs we have at Headwaters is called FARM. It's the Food Alliance of Rural Montana. It's a brand new program you may or may not have heard of, heard about. Um, this summer, southwestern Montana lost its designation as a food and egg development center. And so there was a huge important part of our state that wasn't receiving the services I'm about to tell you about. Food and egg development center is a great program. It's located uh, now in Joliet, Haver, and Ronan. <laughs> and... Uh, provides technical services to all of you guys and is what I would describe as the bullpen for these guys. Um, I can't grow anything. I killed basil this summer and mint and super easy things, not my thing. I'm a fishing guide when I'm not doing this. I like catching fish. That's what I'm also good at. Um, we provide the backup support for you guys who are doing such incredibly important work. And that comes in the form of helping you find funding to do your value added project. Uh, we work with a variety of state and federal grants. We have a ton of experience writing them. We know how to speak their language, which might as well be, you know, Portuguese a lot of the time. 
and we know how these programs work and we can help you leverage your dollars to the best of your ability to help grow your business. Um, is anyone here from Idaho? Perfect. Okay. I'll only offend one. So I grew up in Washington state in Eastern Washington. I've lived in Montana for about 10 years. Montana has the highest opportunity to capitalize on our value added agriculture dollars of any manufacturing sector. We are awful. We let, we grow amazing things here. We ship it out of state to get processed. Growing up in Washington, living in Montana, it drives me bonkers that Idaho is better at us than anything. Like Idaho should never beat us, right? They're right there. I've been on both sides of them. We need to get better at it. And that's what we're all about. Um, the Food Alliance Rural Montana, we do a lot of community events. We just had a taco feed in partnership with the Food Corps in Anaconda last week. It had about 100 people. We teamed up with a local rancher. We served local beef tacos. Um, to a bunch of folks who probably aren't as familiar with it, um, trying to get the message out that you can eat local food, the farmer or rancher can get more dollars out of it, and it can benefit everybody. Um, we do a bunch of trainings, we do those sort of things, and the biggest thing is trying to help get dollars into your businesses. I know, Bob, you've worked with the food and egg centers up in uh, Haver, haven't you? Pretty good experience, beneficial. Um, you can go onto their YouTube page and see a great video of a lot of the things they've done together. Serving this region, we've helped a variety of different businesses. Um, fortunately for us, breweries do qualify. One of our bigger success stories has been Phillipsburg Brewing. Um, the candy store in Drummond, that was one thing I wrote down to be sure to mention. I know you guys are looking at community leaders as part of this subject for the conference. If you want to see a grade A top-notch community leader, go over to Phillipsburg, go talk to Shirley Beck at the candy store and listen to her story about transitioning a community. Um, everybody been to Phillipsburg recently? It's pretty damn cool, right? Like there's no empty storefronts, there's a really vibrant downtown, there's all sorts of good things happening. In large part, that's because Shirley Beck beat her head against the wall for a long time. If you go talk to her, there's the perfect model for transitioning a community and how to be a leader. The support you need, the resources to take advantage of, and how to do it. Um, she also has the most amazing board of where people come from and has this detailed data. Um, I want to see it on a map sometime. The knowledge she has for her business would be a model for anyone as you're looking at what you're doing and trying to move things forward. With that being said, I'll be the exception and be under the time frame. Um, I came really ready to answer questions, tell you guys about what we're doing, and thank you so much for coming to view. Sure. Well, it took uh, three years for us to get uh, jumped through all the hoops, had to be fingerprinted, had to, had to uh, drug all, tested. Pardon me? Did you have to be drug tested? Drug tested. Oh, <laughs> yes, no, it wasn't my fingerprint. No, it's a joke. Um, and all, everybody that worked for me, uh, the FDA, yeah, those guys, uh, <laughs> took their sweet time about getting seed to us. They came late. Uh, we're, we're several states, North Dakota has been doing this for years they've been ahead of us but uh, it's really big in in um, southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan it's a huge market there's a huge interest um, we are going to start with um, crushing the seeds and making hemp uh, seed oil and then taking the, um, the mash and it's very high in protein and making some kind of protein powder for human consumption um, we are just uh, barely learning how to grow this stuff uh, the first this year we had a very heavy rain the day after it's planted, crusted over, and we had a poor emergence. Um, the, uh, after we cut it all full of weeds, the, the folks in, in uh, Canada said, oh, you could have swapped that. And in the beginning, we they, they said, well, the, the seeds start dropping off, but we were afraid of shattering, so we really didn't think about swapping very seriously. And they said, oh yeah, you can swap. So those are the kind of things that, that we're gonna be learning that will be a big help to anybody that wants to get started that we can share information with because um, like every crop there's going to be a lot of tricks and now the, the doors are open a little bit not all the way they want us to destroy all the seed so we have to go through the same procedure every year so that's kind of a nuisance um, uh, but that's where we are it's at least it's beginning and montana could be a leader with this if we um, we took the initiative to go with it now, are you able to use the same crushers as the sassflower or no? yes yep. yeah yeah, it's a very small seed, uh, smaller than safflower, um, and it, it's easily 
trees, we go through the, we, we saved a little seed that we didn't plant, and we just ran a tree to see what it did, and it looked just fine. And then you're going to market the oil house? Yeah, for what? we can market. So we have a couple backups now. Uh, the folks in um, Canada said that they would work with us and market everything. We didn't market here, but we've uh, taken little samples and some of our information to recent food shows in um, Baltimore and in uh, <coughs> California, Anaheim. Well, yeah, and then that was really preliminary, yes, but there's a lot of interest. And, um, but we're starting very small. We started with seven acres. Uh, there were about three or 400 acres planted in Montana. Uh, some of the bigger acreages, uh, they didn't really know what they're gonna do with it. That's not a very good idea. I mean, if you have a new crop, this is one thing, we're talking about principles. Start small, to, um, um, as mentioned, Gabe mentioned it, start small, know where you're gonna market. I always say have a backup market. Uh, besides your uh, primary market because half the time that falls through um, and and start small make little you always make mistakes but if they're small it doesn't torpedo you and uh, you can survive small mistakes but sometimes you can't survive one if you got the whole farm bit on it okay uh-huh go ahead uh, <clears throat> normally we talk about uh, profits when we're talking about marketing and getting it somewhere, but uh, forty percent of our country is obese right now. Kids have a high rate of diabetes, and certainly there's a value on health. Can you address the health uh, and how you consider your responsibility to contribute to health in America? Yes, me. All I think you. all of you. Oh, That'd okay. be. A, I was going to go along the same line. <clears throat> Um, well, I mean, ultimately, anybody that's in the that's in the food business as a farmer, you know, bears, bears some responsibility to the health of, of the people who actually eat um, what we grow. Um, you know, I think part of the part of the success of Timeless, you know, really boils down to the fact that that uh, a lot of the crops that we do, I mean, the pulse crops. Heirloom grains are, um, until recently, were kind of an undiscovered treasure, um, you know, in the um, in the consumer market, you know, if you will. But uh, there's a huge opportunity. You know, I, I mentioned it's working with universities, um, the University Food Services. They are they are very concerned about two things: about uh, uh, their carbon footprint, basically the sustainability of the uh, ingredients they source, and also the health that it um, you know, provides uh, for their you know, for their customers. In, in other words, the schools. Um, additionally, hospitals uh, in many places now, increasingly across the country, are making that connection between nutrition and health. You know, and I think that's that's where we really have an advantage. You know, whether we're certified organic, that's, that's one of the check boxes. You know, but also the nutrient density that Gabe talked about before. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just a huge marketing opportunity, you know, for anybody growing anything these days. Um, I think in the in the years ahead, so we have a responsibility to grow what people need to eat. It's not necessarily what they want to eat today. <laughs> and I say, twenty three hundred years ago, Hippocrates said uh, something like, "Food should be our medicine, and medicine should be our food." And I think that that is becoming back in, uh, in style, at least it's becoming more appreciated. When I talk to my friends in Washington, D.C., and, and the big, one of the big topics, as you all know, still remains, is the health care. And I said, um, you're asking the wrong question, as usual, in Washington. Uh, the question should not be, the most important question is not, what is the best kind of health care? system, the most important question is, why are so many people sick? And it doesn't matter what kind of healthcare system we have, if a significant number of our people are, are sick in this country, chronically ill, we're gonna go broke, we're gonna be, we're gonna go right down the tube. We can't afford, no country can afford to have a significant portion of their uh, population chronically ill, and that's what we're heading for. We mentioned diabetes, but all the chronic illness, the autoimmune diseases, all this stuff. And um, with our research that we've 
we published, I mentioned earlier, and, and then most in Italy, we're spending nearly $200,000 a year in research. And that just started as a very small observation where someone said, I can eat sugar, but I can't eat this other wheat. Why is that? And we are come to understand that there's much more than, to the wheat problem than just gluten. Gluten is, you know, the buzzword, but it's way more, uh, way more than that. And we're finding uh, that the main uh, difference is, is the um, anti-inflammatory properties of this ancient grain compared to the inflammatory properties of modern wheat. And now we're in the process of developing an um, inflammatory index that we could use just to, for a hundred bucks instead of 50 or 60 or 70,000 we spend on an individual research project. But for a hundred bucks or so, we could test the inflammatory properties or inflammatory potential or anti-inflammatory potential of all kinds of food. And I think we, I'd love to, I'm going to visit with Gabe afterwards about his, um, yeah. his app, because I think we can combine those two or maybe have an app that would even be better uh, where people could test it themselves. But inflammation, we're seeing differences between 30 and 40 percent in just in the different types of wheat and inflammation. And this is, this is terrific, uh, terrific amount. And I think it's more than, it's more than just the seed, it's the way we grow it. So comparing our chemical and organic farming, uh, we know we're poisoning the earth. We have Roundup now in our rainfall. It's contaminating the earth. And yet, what are we doing about it? And what is that doing to our, our health as we eat? Everything that we eat contains a teeny tiny amount of Roundup on it now. Almost everywhere uh, we be able to make it down to that level. Um, it's in the water. It's in the soil. It's because it's, it's just pervasive. And it's, until we decide we're going to not poison the earth anymore, we're going to continue to have problems, and we can, we can, we who have and engaged right along this. I really appreciate so much what he was saying. Are finding ways to farm without chemicals. This is the future. This is not a niche. This is the future, and it has to be the future. And we can feed the world in this way, and we will feed the world, and we will feed it healthily. And that's our that's our goal, and that's our mission. And we will do it with your help, because you're buying, <laughs> and that's what we need. Thank you. Keith, any thoughts on that? Well, I'll just add that that's the whole focus of my family's operation is how to equate soil health to human health. And I think it's imperative of those of us who are able to help the communities in that way. You know, the food co-op that was open in Bismarck, uh, my family is the largest contributor to that. And we help get those doors open. If not me, who? If not now, when? You know, you have to, you have to just live by that mantra and just focus everything you can on to getting into getting this nutrient dense food out to the community. The biggest part of this we're working on is education. So, uh, with as rural as our state is, obviously we have a lot of areas where just getting healthy food is really difficult. And then on top of that, you have uh, generations of people who've been surviving on cheap food and don't even know how to cook vegetables or deal with that. And so that's the biggest approach we're taking is how do we get these, how do we get people who have generationally um, ate junk to switch over to eating good food and get them educated on not only why it's good for them, but how do you cook it? And some of the really simple things, we've partnered with NCAT, Arrow, um, a lot of the other organizations are starting to do these public initiatives where it's like, this is why you should be doing it, and also this is how you do it. Um, because it's such an important thing in trying to break that trend of going to the store and just buying junk. I, I gotta add just one quick thing. You know, you know I, I had the opportunity this summer to speak to the National Farmers Union, and I kind of bash, you know, one thing about me, you know, you're going to know where I stand because I'm going to tell you, you know. And I told them, you know, we need to get away from these subsidies in production agriculture so much. And and I had the head of North Dakota State Farmers Union come up and say, "But Gabe, we're entitled to that because we're producing cheap food." And I said, "Yes, and when you start producing nutrition, 
then lets you and I talk. Mm. And that's what I told them. <laughs> but that goes to show you the majority of farmers today yeah. in the conventional mindset are disconnected from the consumer. And I think that's a real issue. When we get farmers talking about producing nutrition instead of cheap food, mm -hmm. then we can have a real discussion. Okay, Patty, let yeah. me just see if there's anybody else. Just, well, just, you've had a couple questions, oh, don't mean to. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so you also, in some form, uh, value add or process food products. And I was wondering if you could each talk about oh, like, what you did to ensure or reduce the risk that there would be a market for those products before you invested heavily in infrastructure that's required to do that. Anybody want to take a shot at that? <laughs> well, one of my, uh, you know, well, uh, one of my principles was uh, don't grow for the don't go for the current market, grow for the next market. Okay, so uh, by and large, my answer to your question is we didn't do that. We sort of did it the other way. We did what you know what, what we thought was right, what we thought where the market might go, would would go, and um, you know, and, and and grew for that market if you will. Um, you know, back in, I mean, back in 87, when, you know, when the four of us started the business, um, I mean, there were hardly any organic farmers in Montana. There was, you know, virtually zero organic market. You know, there was a little on the, there was a little on the coast. And yet, uh, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't assess the market and then say, um, you know, let, let, let's go for the market. We said, what's the right thing to do? Let's create the market for the right thing, and that's that's the path we took. Well, I did both, and uh, I can tell you uh, when I tried to, um, I had an idea when I first saw white wheat come on the market, or come, well, come available from MSU or somebody that's working with white wheat. Uh, this is fantastic because you can have a bread, a whole wheat bread that's not so dark, it's tanned. Uh, be more easily, um, it's, it's, it's taste, it's not so strong in tasting. Um, and so we really pushed that. We grew some, we pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. But guess what? The market wasn't ready for that. And it just went fizzled. And Dean Fulford, about 15 years later, came on the market when it was a different market and he did very well with that. Um, so you have just a certain amount of timing and I think, unless you've got a millions of dollars and go on TV and tell people that they need this, what you have, well, we don't none of us have that. Um, I think it's really important to um, provide to the marketplace really things that they really like and want almost immediately, at least in the, in the amount that you want to sell. We, we've always started very small um, and um, centered in that with the commute we went to the um, we went to the health food market. Uh, we, we, by then I was converted to organic, so we decided it would always be organic. We trade. That was the trademark. The trademark meant it was organic, and uh, the yield was low, so we knew we had to sell it for quite a bit more to uh, pay the farmers, and I was one of them, uh, to grow it. And uh, so, if you're going to pay more and it costs more, it has to have a higher value. And so, we want to go where people are, are appreciating higher value, higher nutritional density. We talked about we certainly have that, and you have to line up with what you have and and know and believe in your product. Uh, and and uh, tell people about it, and those people that are interested in it you can't just go down on Main Street, Montana, and the same when we first started. We couldn't have sold. We couldn't have made a living selling your organic here. <laughs> but in California, they were ready for it, and they wanted it, and they loved it. And uh, when I found out our customers or potential customers were buying wheat from Kansas, I said, "Well." Wait till you try ours, because I knew we had higher protein in Kansas and make better bread. And I, whenever I heard that, I knew that we were going to be have a very good chance of having a new customer. So you have to know. The other thing that we did was try to know more about our product than anybody else, and uh, and, and be a service to our customers. So we would go in the bakery and say, "We'll provide you with what varieties you want and what proteins you want and all this stuff." Guess what? They had no idea. Because they're buying from General Mills and it's just delivered in a sack, it's the same as it always is. Uh, it was meant for a machine. And we were going out to artisan bakers that now they were looking for something different, that they could uh, make something uh, unique. And so those are the type of people that are really interested in something unique. 
And that's what we have to sell. And if they had a problem, we helped them solve it. And so we really focused on customer relations. We just didn't, we always gave people more than they expected, and we, um, and we didn't charge, overcharge. We, we, were, we were fair in what we, what we charged, and we would make it good. If something went wrong, we would take it back, and we would refund their money if they had a complaint or whatever. And that worked very, very well. Gate, any thoughts on your One question? thing we did is, is, well, Simon Sinek has a great book out there, Know Your Why. You've got to know why you do what you do, and it has to be something you believe in, and then you cannot waver from that. We will not ever jeopardize the integrity of our products and our operation just to make more money, because it's all about trust between you and your customer. The other thing I think it's important is to understand trends and where the industry's headed. What are the two fastest growing things right now? Organic, but the one that's growing faster than that is pasture-based products. 25 to 35% clip for the last 25 plus years in a row. No other segment of agriculture can even touch that. And we were growing, raising grass-finished beef for ourselves, why not take it to other people? And so that was the basis before we stocked several million into a, an abattoir. Hey, we had that behind us, knowing that it's growing at this clip and it's not slowing down. And right now, 85% of the grass finished beef sold in the US is imported. If that doesn't tell you the market potential for US raised grass finished products, my goodness, huge. Huh. What is the uh, length of the grass fed? that you guys sell? Yeah, we're selling them. Um, we're, we're we can start harvesting them at about two years of age. The majority are at 27 to 28 months. But last year we did that for $1,279 per head, including cow costs. That will rival any feedlot anywhere. <laughs> so not only are we providing what we think is a much superior product health-wise, but we're doing it at a much, we can raise it for a much lower cost even. Now, in saying that, I'm not going to sell it. You know, I'm a capitalist. I'm going to make money when I can. So, yeah. on to that, because um, you're in North Dakota too, so how do you uh, supply that market throughout, like, the winter months? Yeah, we're killing the majority of animals. Like, we just ship several semi-loads. We're, we're, we're killing as much as we can at our local plant, but our operation's growing to the point we need semi-load lots, so we're shipping those are being processed at a USDA facility in Missouri. And so then it's frozen product. We only sell frozen product. That uh, Gabe is um, pasture-raised proteins. The bottleneck I see in the future and like farmers and ranchers disappearing is also processors. Yep. And where where the, the true benefit to me in, in pasture-raised proteins is somebody just down the street. You never get sick from from the small guys, the quantity is always yep. where the sickness comes from. So how do you foresee us, I mean that's one of my biggest fears as just new into this is that um, the processes have me by about 20 years yep. and what's going to happen because nobody, it's not glamorous and nobody can afford to replace it. Yep. yep. Let me give you this as an example, JBS, largest meat supplier, for them to kill and process an animal, it's $63 a head. The average small abattoir, it's over $500 per head. Believe it or not, I can ship our animals, they actually get killed in Omaha, primal ship to Missouri, fabricated there, ship back up, up to us, much cheaper than I can do it at my own plant. Because it's economies of scale. In saying that, I'm gonna support the local abattoir as much as possible. But, make no mistake about it, Labor is our biggest challenge in that small plant, getting the people there. The, the plant that's cutting the meat for us down in Missouri is guaranteeing us every steak and roast is cut within a quarter of an ounce. You know, variation is all. That way we can sell on the internet by price point versus by the pound, which really speeds things up. We can't get the, the labor locally to be able to do that. So. It becomes a matter of investment, and you have to invest in those small laboratories. Trooper Joe, well, back to the education thing because I'm just crazy about it. 
we've got to be able to get cooking back into especially the middle school and working with Montana products. How can we do that at scale? We're trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a huge proponent of the Harvest in the Month program. Right. I think that's a real big step in the right direction, but uh, I wish I had an answer because I agree. Um, prior to doing this, I spent a lot of time in the schools. I'd never be there. It's such an important thing, both from when you get to the school as well as being able to teach people how to cook again. Um, hopefully we can follow up soon and tell you how, but I certainly don't know, but agree it's so, so I don't bad. think the universities are even turning out um, teachers that can teach it. Is no. That... I don't know of any of our local schools that offer <laughs> when, that type of class. If I might, when a local school considers ketchup a vegetable, oh, yeah. you know that they're wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or your high school daughter takes a cooking class in high school and it's they learned everything in the microwave. So, oh my God. I know. With that said, this has been an amazing uh, hour that we spent. Um, just a few things before we give all these guys a round of applause. Some of the things that I heard was obviously value added is important. Trust is the key. Um, you need to know who, know your why, give service to your customer, grow, change with your clientele and give them what they need. Um, innovate, be unique, grow for the future, set your price high um, so you have a high margin and you can make a living off what you're doing. Diversify your market and start small, but also create your own market. So thank you so much for your time and let's give everybody a round of applause.